Great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Preparing for the Unknown, How to Support Employees During a Possible Recession. My name is Carolyn Lind. I'm a Senior Vice President and Talent Strategist at Northern Trust, and I'm pleased to serve on the Hermac Institute Council of Advisors here at the Executives Club and also as your moderator this afternoon. One quick housekeeping note before we begin. Uh, this program is eligible for SHRM recertification credits. You can find the activity code in the chat. Um, we are working on our certification with HRCI for those that are looking for that. That's a priority for us in 2023. Today's discussion will focus on the potential impacts of a recession on the labor market and what we can do to prepare. We have two incredible speakers joining us today to discuss their viewpoints as a labor economist and a CHRO. We're very pleased to welcome Marianne Bertrand, Professor and Co-Director of Chicago Booth Rostandi Center for Social Sector Innovation and Director of the Inclusive Economy Lab at the University of Chicago Urban Labs, as well as Holly May, Executive Vice President and Global Chief Human Resources Officer at the Walgreens Booths Alliance. If you have questions throughout the program, please add them to the Q&A box and we'll take some as we go along as well as have Q&A at the end. With that, let's get started. Our first question is for Marianne. As a labor economist, what's your view of the economy right now? Great, well, so first, like, thanks for, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, I, um, I would start by saying that the economy has been recovering tremendously from you know, the COVID crisis. Um, and we could have been a much, you know, much worse, worse place than, you know, that we are right now. I mean, I think it's very clear to everyone that the main concern about the economy at this moment is inflation and, you know, kind of taming, you know, taming inflation and preventing it from spiraling. That closely tied to what's happening in the labor market, right? So we've seen increasing inflation, which in the early days were very much linked to supply chain disruptions, issues related to um, the war in Ukraine and uh, energy costs. At this moment, I think we are, you know, kind of more and more confident that the labor market is also playing a role in uh, fueling part of this inflation. So I think the big concern right now is that the labor market is in a sense too hot. We have a ratio of vacancies to unemployed that is kind of out of the normal. I think the number is about two at this moment. We can expand a bit later on what that means and, um, and all of that. Now, the question is, with that kind of tightness in the labor market, you know, we are entering you know, a period where we should be concerned, and certainly the Fed is concerned about wage price spirals. Mm -hmm. Employers are considering what to pay um, their barbers, they are expecting that other barber shops will increase the salaries of barbers by 2%, thinking that we're able to also raise the price of the haircut at the same time. With those expectations, the barbers are going to raise those prices by 2%, the wages by 2%, the price by 2%. Mm -hmm. That's really the concern that I think is core right now to all of the Fed discussions. How do we tame you know, this inflation? And Thinking about the labor market being too hard, they really, you know, two ways to adjust that. One is supply and the other one is demand, right? And the Fed is mainly to adopt to try to kind of reduce demand, you know, as a way to try to, you know, kind of um, correct uh, this imbalance. Trying to change supply would be trying to bring more people into the workforce that we have right now, something that I'd love to talk about later in the call. Unfortunately, trying to increase labor supply is going to be much harder and much slower than what the fund is attempting to do. So in a nutshell, the economy is doing well. The main concern is inflation. And the main worry is whether the, there will be a soft landing and the ability to kind of like slow down this kind of wage price spiral without taking too many people out of the workforce. I think that's the big question. Thank you. Holly, could you comment from your perspective as a global CHRO, what are you experiencing in the labor market right now? Well, absolutely. And thank you for having me here today. Uh, look, I fully, I fully agree with Marianne. We, we definitely have an imbalanced hiring market right now. I know there was a study from November that showed in certain industries, uh, companies are actually overstaffed between five and 10% after the most recent hiring surge. 
And based on a PwC uh, pulse survey conducted in October, the vast majority of CHROs surveyed are currently looking at ways to reduce headcount, whether that be through layoffs, voluntary retirements, you know, performance-based cuts, what have you. And, you know, if hiring does become more competitive down the road, you know, employers are going to need to increase wages, benefits, uh, job conditions to get people in the door. And, you know, back back to uh, Marianne's point about the supply, you know, we have retiring baby boomers. We have falling college enrollment right now. We have very limiting immigration policies and a lot of employees that are just dropping out of the workforce altogether. So I do think, you know, going forward, leaders are going to need to be very cautious when approaching labor cuts, um, you know, in anticipation of an economic downturn, um, as we we don't know if uh, there is a rebound, if it's going to be quick, um, you know, potentially could even be in 2023 by mid-year. It's an interesting tension between that tight labor market and simultaneously looking at the potential for a recession. Right. Um, Marianne, can you comment on some of the signs of recession that companies should be looking for and what those signs might mean for them? I, I can comment, but like this is the moment where I should highlight that I'm, I'm a labor economist. I'm not a microeconomist, so I don't think I'm the best, uh, the best person to answer this question. I'm very sure that a lot of employers out there have, you know, kind of even more, have more experience than I have about this. Obviously, people are keeping track of yield curves, you know, any future action, you know, kind of by the Fed is going to be looked at, you know, kind of very closely. Um, standard kind of like leading indicators are measures of consumer sentiments. You know, I think all of those are, you know, important to keep an eye on with the increase in interest rates, obviously lots of people are paying attention to what's happening in the housing market right now. Mm -hmm. So building permits, uh, all that, you know, mortgage kind of new mortgages, all of this, I think are probably going to be the segments of the housing market is going to be one segment of the economy where, you know, we may see early signs of, you know, of what's, of what's to come and whether or not we'll get that soft landing. Marianne, I think you, you talked a little bit about the wage price spiral and Holly, you also commented on some of the reasons that that, that labor pool is getting smaller and smaller. Um, Holly, could you talk a little bit about how you plan on dealing with wages and staying competitive in that tight market or what you know that other companies are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I would start by saying remaining competitive or becoming competitive, it goes far beyond wages. I, I would say wages in many ways serve as a prerequisite. Um, and as, as you look at generational differences with employees, um, compensation really does differ in importance drastically. But in terms of wages, and I'm not making any recommendations here. I think broad uh, insights and recommendations are, are less helpful as every situation has specific nuances around business dynamics, um, you know, your comp approach and your staffing profile. But what I would say is you really need to make a distinction here between the cost of labor and the cost of living. And that usually the cost of labor is what drives uh, merit budgets, uh, salary budgets being set every year by employers. Um, and this past year broadly, I believe the average was about 4.5%. Um, and on top of that, we were seeing a lot of incremental promotion and equity adjustments on top of merit budgets. And I think it's important that we continue tracking wages and compensation on this basis versus having an immediate reaction to inflation and the cost of living. Um, now, that being said, I would say if we see longer term inflation, if we see really sustained cost of living increases year over year, I think you'll see companies um, adjust for that. But currently, as we've been keeping an eye on the market, we're not seeing companies uh, really deviate from our uh, standard practice of tracking uh, cost of labor and, you know, making decisions about salaries and merit budgets on that basis. 
So, you know, I, I would, you know, for, for all of you, I would, you know, from my perspective, we're not currently, you know, linking to, to inflation. We're still tracking cost of labor. Um, and we think that's right, especially as we're moving into a recession. We know that a lot of organizations are going to be cutting costs. Um, and, you know, we, we believe that uh, that's the right move to make. Would you add anything to that, Marianne, based on what you've heard others doing or what you see? No, I don't, you know, kind of, I, I don't feel like I'm in a good position, not setting anybody's, you know, not setting anybody's compensation. So I don't have, you know, any direct experience that's relevant to like what employers are doing at this point outside of, you know, what Holly um, kind of um, documented or discussed. So you touched on this a little bit, Holly, but this question is really for both of you. Um, beyond just that, that compensation and wages, what else do you think that companies need to do to stay competitive these days? One, maybe I'll, I'll start. I think, you know, kind of one margin that's been, you know, that's been an important one has been um, the remote work option or like the, the flexible work option. I think we have no kind of a, solid research that documents that, you know, kind of the, the move to, to remote work will remain there for, you know, for a long time for a class of, class of workers. I think, you know, the remote work options, I think, is particularly feasible for, you know, a segment of the population that's, you know, that's more educated. Um, I think that we have also evidence that, that, that companies have used this, this new amenity in a way as a way to try to, you know, kind of attract and, you know, and retain um, all of those workers that value this amenity. So there's some gains of like not having to, you know, not having to commute. Employers are, I think if at least some of them have been convinced by this crazy experiment that we run over the last two years that people can indeed work from home and be productive from home. So I'm, Assuming I'd love to hear what Ali says, you know, in terms of what's happening at her company, but like a lot of employers are using that tool and that flexibility and offering it to a set of workers as a way to attract them um, and, and, and retain them. And again, I just want to be very clear that this is not an option that's going to be, you know, available to, you know, all class of workers, but right. certainly for sub-segments, it's, it's very much there. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, Marianne. And I think, you know, there are a new set of expectations from the global workforce right now coming out of the pandemic. And I'd say, you know, there are a new set of prerequisites uh, for, for employers now. And I probably could summarize those prerequisites in, in two terms. I think it's flexibility and choice. And remote work is is a big part of that. And you know, as you correctly stated, I think it, it looks very different depending on you know what your workforce looks like um, and you know, the different segments of that population. But I would also say, you know, strong culture is really key, and making sure you also have a shared purpose as the foundation of your employer employee relationship. Um, I know it at WBA, uh, our purpose is more joyful lives through better health. And we find that, you know, our, our employees connect to that and the candidates who are applying for opportunities with us, that that's a strong, um, you know, talent attractor for us. But we've also created a vision that's specific to our workforce, to our, our team members, and it's to care for our team members as whole people. And our people strategy was really developed through this lens and it what it really means is shaping the policies and delivering the programs that consider both the personal and the professional aspects of an employee's life you know beyond the 9 to 5 and it really starts with recognizing and embracing each person for the unique individual they are and their unique needs and i think remote work plays into that quite well. Um, another example um, of something we launched earlier this year is a campaign that's called I Am We Are, and it encourages team members to share insights into who they are as individuals, six attributes which best describe them as a person, along with a photo. 
And then we would auto generate a personal social card that could be shared internally or externally through LinkedIn or other social channels. I'll tell you um, a couple of mine, um, a fierce mama, a Lego enthusiast. And I don't know if you can see behind me, I've got some of my Lego creations and I'm a neurodiversity advocate. So for us, this we saw as real exercise and vulnerability for some and affirmation for others as they shared their stories. And it built connection and relationships that grew through this. And it also became a great team building tool for meaningful conversations about how managers can best support the individuals on their team and making sure that they're set up for success in the workplace. Well, I totally agree. I mean, without having the specific examples of what's happening at Walgreens is that I, I, I think we have more and more evidence of a, of a generation, generational shift that the young people that are entering the workforce right now are, are expecting. And again, you know, kind of we are in a moment where there are lots of jobs. This may not be the case next year, but like they're expecting, you know, more of their workplace than just a paycheck. They're expecting really a meaningful experiences. They come to these workplace with values and very much hope to, you know, work with employers that will be, you know, sharing, you know, kind of, you know, sharing those values and, um, and fostering them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Gen Z now makes up a third of the world's population and they, they don't remember a world before, you know, our, our smartphones and they're used to playing games and finding uh, dates and hanging out online and, you know, the studies are showing that this group now cares about compensation less than any other generation before them. So really organizations, companies need to think about their value proposition very differently and potentially changing their ways of working as well to really attract um, this new generation coming into the workforce right now. Absolutely. You know, I think something else that we hear, you know, I think this is for everyone, but especially for the newer generations is thinking about what that career path and what that career support looks like in their employer. Could you talk a little bit about what you're thinking about that, Holly? Um, and then we can also hear from Marianne. No, absolutely. What what I would say is, you know, as an employer, and I could speak about us a bit, but, you know, regardless of industry, I think one of the most important things you could do is listen to your workforce. Um, I don't believe in one size fits all approaches. I think um, you need to listen to the different segments of your, your workforce population and you need to respond on that basis. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. And this also speaks to, you know, our employees time outside of the workplace and their families. But um, the listening to our employees led to the development of our new mental health and well-being program, which is called Be Well Connected. And we ex extended that not only to our team members internally, but also to their families. And it's really focused on supporting the whole team member uh, in their comprehensive health, um, body, mind, and spirit. And we did that through a trio of platforms. Um, you know, the, the first was really our EAP foundational solution that includes, you know, five free mental health counseling sessions. Uh, the second was uh, Journey Live, um, which is a platform that offers live classes with expert instructors on a variety of topics. So think, uh, social media, uh, addiction, stress, anxiety, lack of sleep. Um, and then the third is IndieFlix, um, and they produce short mental health related films to raise awareness um, and really serve as a conversation catalyst. I mean, that one we, we often refer to as WBA's own uh, Sundance channel. So since introducing those resources and responding to our employees, you know, we now have more than 227,000 employees and their family members who are have downloaded and are using the Journey Live app and resources. And, you know, and that's that's out of our um, our global population is 315,000 employees. So, you know, we're finding that, you know, our employees are really responding, but, you know, it doesn't end there. You know, we're continuing to check in, you know, 
being very upfront that we don't get things right on the first time. And there's usually a need to listen and adjust and try things. But, you know, one of our corporate values is being courageous and we're, we've been thinking out of the box, you know, in, in ensuring we can deliver for them. Thank you. Um, we are taking the questions as they come in. So if, if you all listening have additional questions for the panelists, please pop them in there. Um, can we hear a little bit about just leadership development? I think this is one of the most challenging times that many leaders have been through because it's been one thing after another really for the past couple of years. What are you doing to support leaders at Walgreens? Well, it, it, this goes back to our uh, really employee vision, um, caring for our team members as whole people and making sure we're creating an inclu inclusive environment where they can bring their whole selves to work. And I think if if there's a group that uh, really delivers on that the most, it's our it's our managers. And a big part of that is building trusted relationships with their teams to ensure their team members feel comfortable coming to them, to express their needs, um, to make sure that they, they have the, um, the work patterns, the schedules that, that are gonna work most for them. And I think as leaders, the, the best thing we can do is embrace vulnerability. You know, if, if we're not open about our own challenges and what we're dealing with individually, we're implicitly not providing our team members with permission to do the same. Um, the term I like to use for myself is being unapologetically human. So if I'm running late and my son spills apple juice down the front of my blouse, I don't come in and act like, uh, you know, I've had a perfect morning and I'm prepared for the day. I'm honest with my team about what's going on. And I think it's really build trust in relationships. And I think, you know, encouraging our managers, training our leaders um, to, to approach their work relationships in that way has, has been incredibly successful. And I think, you know, I joined the organization a year ago. I, I walked into an organization that already had a very strong foundation and a really strong culture and employer and employee relationships um, that, that were there. So um, it's been great to see that only be enhanced over time. Fantastic. Um, we had a question following up on your previous commentary, Holly, about EAP programs and well-being. How are you getting employees to really engage? I think a lot of organizations have the challenge that they offer things and then they find that employees don't take advantage of that for whatever reason. Um, you know, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I think that's important. I think, you know, I'd go back to my point of the, the first step in all of this is listening and making sure that you're delivering on their needs. Um, but, you know, as a former, I've spent most of my career in, in uh, compensation and benefits prior to, uh, to moving into the CHR role. And I would say communication when it comes to introducing new benefits and new programming is absolutely key. Making sure you're meeting your employees where they are and helping them understand how it could benefit them individually and, and what they could personally need out of these programs um, that you may be introducing. Um, so I think you know, having that willingness to continue to check in after you release things, you know, reinforce what's out there, but also that uh, openness to adjust. You know, you may not get it right on the first time. So be flexible. Think about how you could either build upon or adjust and change uh, what you roll out. I think that's really key. And I think it sends a really good message to your workforce and gets them, you know, more excited uh, to try things out. Another thing that you might want to consider um, that, that we've done in our relationship with Journey Live is we've been working with them to deliver really specific content to our employees. So something that they're going to be rolling out in December um, is, a, you know, something, a class specific to pharmacists and how they're managing their, their mental health in, in, in our stores. They're also going to be releasing a class specific to uh, parents with children with special needs. Um, we heard from our workforce through our business resource groups that that was something that our employees were really interested in. And so we were working with our partners to deliver it. So customization, I think, also is an avenue you can explore. Um, 
Um, Marianne, this is the question I'm going to point towards you, and I think there's no right answer to the, the conclusion to this question, which is, is it a good time to change jobs? Because we keep hearing that there might be a recession, there might not, this is the biggest like, will they or won't they question in a while. Um, what, what would you consider when answering that question? Uh, as you said, there's no right or wrong answer to this question. So, you know, it depends kind of how, you know, how, how, how high your expectations are about, you know, recession coming. Obviously, this is a good time to try to, you know, kind of, you want to ignore the risk of recession. I think it's a good time, you know, for people to explore, you know, to explore more opportunities. And, and you know, I wanted to go back to this. I think the reason why we have such a high vacancy rate relative to the, the share of people unemployed is that we've seen just a lot of reallocation in the labor market. So, uh, and that's kind of one of the, you know, kind of maybe one of the reasons we should not worry so much about this high vacancy rate for um, share unemployed. Obviously, you know, the, the risk if there is a recession is that you have lots of corporations operating by the last in first out type of, you know, type of dynamics. So um, joining a company right now, if things go south next year, kind of probably increases the odds of, um, you know, of being, um, of being displaced uh, at the beginning of recession. But, um, you know, kind of, I, I think that I'm all for thinking about trying to match people with the best, you know, labor market opportunities that fits them. So if there's a job out there that sounds like a better match for you, you know, I would go ahead. But that sounds beyond, you know, that sounds more like my personal view than, you know, kind of my <laughs> economic reasoning on this question. Well said, well said. Um, related to that, we got a question about what we're seeing for young employees entering the labor market and starting their careers. Um, both in, in general, but also in this remote hybrid environment, so questions of mentoring, training, yeah. you know, I think just this weekend there was an article about how young people are seeing a lot of these tech layoffs and what seemed like a great career path. They're now thinking, oh gosh, maybe I want something a little bit more stable would be okay. Um, what, are, what are you seeing in terms of what people just entering the labor market are looking for? Yeah, I think I think the tech the tech thing is, I would view that as something different. I think, I think we... There's a sense in which kind of, you know, kind of the, the tech industry was, you know, was overvalued. And I think we are seeing some kind of, you know, kind of adjustment to, uh, to what is more realistic about, you know, the value of these companies. So I think going to the beginning of your question, which is entering the workforce, you know, kind of exploding the, the new flexibility that may exist out there. I, I think it has clear pluses that we have, you know, discussed before. I think there's a lot that one can do in terms of, you know, in terms of like being productive at the home and also maybe deriving more value from that work because of all the flexibility it gives us to not spend time in commute and to do other things with, you know, kind of with our life while still being, you know, while still being productive. I do a lot of work on, um, on the on gender gaps in, in the labor market. And I, I think there is, and there should be a lot of optimism about kind of how remote work can provide the kind of flexibility that a lot of, you know, kind of um, either young women, young mothers that had existed in the workforce, want to re-enter the workforce, um, could really leverage to, you know, try to be, you know, kind of full members of the labor force, which would not have been, you know, present absent the remote options. I do, though, kind of share, you know, what I think was in your question, kind of some concerns. I, I worry about this kind of two-tier workplace where some people are working from home, doing great, but not really being kind of connected to whatever kind of social networking, more protocol life may be happening on the water cooler in the office. And it's, I think it's still, still to be determined whether, whether companies that are embracing the remote work option will also be able to make sure that those employees that are remote, you know, kind of are really kind of fully integrated inside of the organization and are, in a sense, eligible for all of the same kind of career promotion opportunities and people that decide um, that decide to go back to the office. Yeah, Marianne, I think it's a very challenging um, problem to solve. 
um, this concept of remote work and, and hybrid work. And I'll tell you what, what we've done at WVA is we have a hybrid policy. Um, you'll see many organizations, they'll say we have to be in two days a week or these specific three days. But for us, we've developed a policy that's entirely leader led. Um, and it's really based on empowerment, care, and trust. So we don't dictate the number of days you come in. We don't dictate, you know, which office you go into. And we also consider in-person experiences to be out in our stores, you know, getting to see what our pharmacists are experiencing, going into our distribution centers, you know, engaging with our, our field workforce more. And the, the way that we're doing this, where we're, we're, we're trying to achieve that balance between what we believe are our valuable experiences being in person and the flexibility offered with remote work is we've created a, a accountability for our leaders through a shared performance goal that really focuses on results. So results-based performance management, the outcome, you know, not the effort on, uh, undergone to achieve it, as well as making sure there's certain what we call moments that matter. Um, experiences and events that are taking place uh, either in our offices or in other locations where people can gather, you know, to, to work on uh, big strategic problems as a group, um, to engage and reconnect uh, to our culture. And, you know, we, we're regularly, you know, surveying and checking in on what's working and what's not. And we're, so far, we're, we're getting good response, but, you know, yeah, continuing to listen uh, and adjust as necessary. But, uh, you know, agree with you, it's a critical component, but it needs to be balanced. Holly, obviously Walgreens um, Boots Alliance is a place where you have some jobs that can only be done in person. And you have some jobs where you probably have people that are like, I'm never setting foot in an office again. How do you balance that tension in your workforce, and Marianne, how, do you see that that dichotomy playing out more broadly in the labor market that there are just some jobs that like they have to be in person? And what does that do? Yeah, I mean, I can start and I'd love to hear how Holly balances it. But, you know, kind of big picture, this is exactly what you would expect. I think, you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a partition and the jobs that can be done remotely tend to be jobs that require kind of more education. So you see you know, kind of you see these kind of remote options being, you know, available, these flexible options being available to the more educated workforce and much less so for people that work in, you know, service sector, kind of retail that tend to be kind of less educated. What's interesting about it, kind of, again, thinking about the, 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 the whole kind of labor market is that, and given what we said before about the fact that people really value these remote options is that we've seen for the first time in 40 or 50 years, wage compression, right? So we have, you know, experienced 50 years or so of stagnant wages at the bottom of the income distributions and increasing wages uh, at the top. Over the last two years, uh, we've seen, you know, kind of that, you know, that changing sign. Uh, and I think part of it has been the remote thing, which I've mentioned many times. So people value these remote options. There's a you know, that means you don't have to raise their wages as much to attract them if you give them this option. And I think the other reason is being that the, um, the, the, the lack of workers has been particularly important for those jobs that are more uh, kind of less, you know, kind of uh, the less educated ones. So jobs in retail, jobs in hospitality sectors, you know, kind of uh, food services, services, that's where you know, employers are struggling the most to try to, you know, to try to find workers and hence, you know, that has boosted up the nominal wages for these workers, right? So I'm not saying that they are better off in real terms because unfortunately, as we said at the beginning, we're dealing with inflation, but we've seen nominal wages going up for, you know, for these groups. Holly, you should, you know, I'd love to know how you guys balance all of this. So. No, and I, I think, um, you know, the challenge that that Carolyn described is true for, for so many retailers and i think we really we really address it in two ways i think the first is you know the building that i'm sitting in right now we do not refer to as a headquarters in deerfield illinois we refer to it as, as a support center 
So really, you know, setting the tone that, that everything we're doing here is in support of our stores and support of our, you know, workers in our distribution centers. So um, the value of really uh, reaching out to them, engaging with them, understanding their needs, and then delivering on it is a core part of our culture and, and what we commit to as an organization. I think the second part of this um, that we do to address it is really thinking about um, when you go out, uh, you know, really even starting with our hourly employees, our customer service associates in our stores, how do you create a career path for them to further develop in their careers to potentially, uh, you know, move up the ranks. Um, we have a wonderful program that takes our customer service associates and trains them to become pharmacy technicians, and then a program to consider moving pharmacy technicians into pharmacist roles, and then a rotation program that brings those pharmacists into the support center to work um, on, on initiatives that we're driving here. So I think being very clear in showing the opportunities that um, lead to to, you know, movement in your career, movement across roles, um, and, you know, movement, uh, you know, potentially in, into roles where increased flexibility as a, is an option is, is key. Uh, but, you know, we, we understand our, our, um, our workforce needs are different across the board. Uh, so at any point in that journey, we're, we're making sure it's the best employee experience possible. I, I cannot under, you know, overstates how important what, you know, Holly just described. And, you know, one could view this as, and I don't know whether that's what, how long Walgreens has got this program in place, but clearly, you know, kind of investing in the workforce, investing, especially in this kind of lower skilled workforce, skilling them, you know, helping them move up, you know, the corporate hierarchy is an instrumental way to try to attract most, most of these workers and the way to differentiate yourself from, you know, from competitors. It's, you know, it makes economic sense right now as, you know, companies are struggling to, you know, to attract, you know, to attract these workers. I, I wish that, we, that it would make, you know, that the companies would realize it making economic sense even outside of the current tightness of, uh, of the labor market. It, it, my sense is that, you know, there's just too little investment, you know, in the workforce by, you know, by the private sector. And um, it's exciting to hear about a company that's, you know, that's taking that very seriously. We both walked right into one of our questions that was about this tension and sort of the tightening of the, the labor market and moving towards either more of a skills-based approach or thinking about non-traditional sources of talent. I know it, at Northern Trust, we've started looking at, are there more of our jobs that you could actually go into without a college degree and then be developed into them? Or could we have a partnership with say, the City Colleges of Chicago to grow people into those roles? Um, I think our, our audience would be really interested in hearing what creative ways you've seen um, companies just tap into new talent pools. I don't know, would you like, I, I, I would, uh, Mary, do you want to kick off? No, no, go first. I can go, I can go second. No, I, I think you're absolutely seeing and hearing more about that, about, you know, really thinking about what skill sets are necessary. Do you need a college degree to perform every job in our organization? Um, and making sure you're providing programs that not only consider getting the candidates with all the experience you need um, into a role, but also providing the development on the front end to prepare them to take that role if they have that foundational knowledge needed. So I think you're seeing so much creativity that I hope extends you know, far beyond this, this period of, you know, economic uncertainty, you know, these are practices that I, I hope uh, organizations and HR functions realize are, are really critical uh, to the future. I think, you know, one of the things we've been involved in is, you know, we have a nationally um, recognized by the Department of Labor apprenticeship program, you know, to, so how do we ready people um, to move into, pharmacy um, tech positions, um, and how do we provide the education, the tools to pass the exams, uh, the study materials, you know, if if they don't pass on their first go, what it, what is the plan of action? How long do you provide them? You know, we provide 18 months um, in our apprenticeship programs to help people um, to continue to prepare um, and eventually hopefully pass uh, that exam. But, you know, I think what, what you're finding is organizations are realizing they almost have to grow their own labor pools. 
Um, I know it's been true for us. I mean, pharmacy enrollment is way down over the past two or three years. Um, so we're thinking about, we have this wonderful workforce, you know, how, how do we bring in new talent into a labor pool that might not have considered it before? And how do we take the talent we already have and potentially, you know, move them um, into roles that not only further their career, um, but also, also help us keep fully staffed, um, which has been very critical during a pandemic. Yeah, I think all of these, you know, upskilling kind of reskilling programs, you know, kind of are extremely exciting. Again, this is kind of a bit of a silver lining of all of this is that, you know, the moment I think gave an incentive for firms to do more of them, they may realize the value of these, you know, kind of skilling programs, even absent uh, the current labor market conditions. The one other margin that, you know, I know of that is, I think, also an important one that we are seeing movement on is the kind of criteria companies are, are putting when deciding to hire someone with some kind of um, criminal kind of criminal background, um, you know, kind of there's been in, you know, times when the market has much less tight, you know, kind of companies don't want to experiment, are very worried and are very stringent uh, in disqualifying anybody that has any kind of black mark on their on the criminal records. I'm hearing certainly of more and more companies kind of wanting to, you know, kind of do something, you know, do something different because, you know, they need to fill in those jobs. And I think this is going to be, again, a moment for learning. I think there's a lot of people that, that have been historically, you know, kind of um, not, uh, not able to, you know, to access jobs, even though they would do very well and would be very productive. Companies were very risk averse. And I think they may learn in this moment in time that, you know, people, lots of people out there deserve, you know, deserve a second chance. So I'm also optimistic that will be a silver lining. Helpful. Um, Marianne, I have a specific question about some things in the labor market. And then I was wondering if we could switch over and have Holly comment a little bit on assuming that we are moving into some sort of recessionary period. How can um, HR folks and companies best prepare to support their employees? So, Marianne, um, it's a long question, so you can answer this in any order that you see fit. But when you look at the next 36 months out in terms of that labor pendulum, potentially swinging between unemployment and job openings. Do you think that as we get further and further away from the pandemic, we will see more people come back into the workforce or enter the workforce? When, when is this going to start to feel kind of normal again? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, I think that we have a, you know, so I think it's very clear that labor force participation is below what it should have been if the, the pre-COVID trend had, you know, had persisted. They are, Billions of people that should be in the workforce and are not in the workforce. So will these people come back? I think is you know kind of really the key question. And in order to you know to understand that, we have to try to understand who are the people that are missing, who are the people that should be in the workforce right now and are not there, and hence kind of in part responsible for this you know for this tightness. Uh, there are a few kind of big uh, big factors. One is long COVID. Um, the last numbers I've seen suggest that 17, 18 million people are suffering from long COVID. And not all of these people would have been part of the, of the labor force, but best estimate about a quarter of them would have been the labor force, kind of, you know, working age, um, kind of uh, labor force. So that's about 4 million people that are out of the labor force because of long COVID. What will happen? Will these people re-enter? I really don't know. I think, you know, that's kind of more a question for the medical science in the sense that it's still trying to understand what long COVID is, but I think that's definitely one, you know, one very large group. I think another, uh, another kind of important, you know, important factor, and I think Holly, you mentioned it, uh, I think in your very first remark, is that the U.S. has seen way, um, you know, kind of numbers of, of immigrants coming into the country that are much, much lower than uh, what was happening historically. And obviously kind of a lot of immigration did not happen, you know, during COVID, but that preceded 2020. So I think if you go back to 2018, 2019 is when we start seeing a slowdown on the number of, of immigrants. I think some of it kind of a reflection of probably some, some policies that um, the executive government had, you know, had in place at the time. There has been a, a bit of an uptick, but we are nowhere close to the, you know, kind of immigration numbers, people that come into the work, that, that come to the U.S., you know, to work that we had before. That's millions and millions of, of, 
of uh, of immigrants missing, and and it's very you know kind of relevant to the labor market situation right now because a lot of this immigrant workforce would be disproportionately working in those sectors that are the tightest right now: hospitality, food services, general services, healthcare services. This is kind of a very very important block. Um, there's been some early retirements. My best sense is that these people have kind of come back when wages starting kind of coming back up. So I don't, I, I don't know how important of a force that, you know, that still is right now. And then the final one, which I think is, is very important is that you have, you have issues in some particular sector that have great spillover effects. By this, I have in mind education, sir, education sector, healthcare sector, um, nurseries, uh, elderly care. So these are sectors of the economy that obviously have been tremendously impacted by COVID. Lots of people have left those jobs. These sectors are really struggling to, you know, to hire and they are massive spillovers, right? So if you are, you know, someone that is with dependents, whether they are young children or elderly, the fact that these sectors are not back in equilibrium is holding back your own kind of labor force participation. So I think fixing those kind of healthcare, education care sectors should you know, bring back a bunch of people that, you know, have left the workforce. So that's kind of, you know, kind of the, the, the four kind of big blocks, um, kind of the, the long COVID, the lack of immigration, uh, the low immigration numbers, some kind of retirement margin, but I think much less important, and all of the continuing kind of disruptions in uh, education and early care, uh, early, early child care and elderly care. Thank you. All right, Holly, if we switch to you, if we assume that we are going into some sort of recessionary period, what should we all be thinking about in terms of how to support um, our employees through that time? Yeah, so I, I would say, first of all, I think there are some industries that are more recession proof than others. Um, I think we're going to see that some are going to downsize significantly while others will perhaps even remain understaffed. Um, so I think, you know, as an organization, you, you need to stay focused on making sure you have a strategic growth agenda in place. You know, you can't cut your way to growth and remaining focused on hiring the talent with the skill sets that are going to drive your, your growth. So making sure you, you have the right talent agenda there. Um, the other thing I would say about maybe what what you should not do, um, if if history is is a predictor of what could happen here, you know, you you would often see organizations look to cut um, environmental sustainability, um, cut diversity budgets. Usually, a, a place uh, when you're going into um, a recession or economic uncertainty, that's where you would look, and I think that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Um, for many reasons, and um, you know, we we feel str very strongly about this at WBA. I think you know, back to the point I was making before about you know a corporate purpose that your employees can connect to, and this new generation um, joining the workforce, and even beyond that, not only the you know your workforce, but your customers, um, institutional investors you know, um, your commitment to diversity as an organization, your commitment to inclusion and environmental sustainability, I don't think has, has been more important. And your employees, your customers, they care about what you stand for as an organization. They care about the public commitments um, you're making and they care about your, your delivery on those. So I would say um, in terms of what you should and should not do, I, I would say um, in terms of what you should do, these kind of tight labor market HR management practices are key and I hope they continue. But I, you know, I really hope organizations realize that, that you know, taking a step back um, from those key imperatives in ESG um, you know, would be a mistake. Marianne, would you add anything to that in terms of what companies might want to think about going into a recession? No, except, you know, kind of just to echo what, you know, Holly was saying, I think there's a set of practices, I think that's a theme that's coming back in this kind of little, little seminar that have been developed out of the needs of, you know, from, you know, from this very tight, you know, kind of labor market. I think 
there are practices that should make sense for your organization. You know, kind of, I love to think about organization as being less short-term oriented, kind of more long-term oriented and all the practices that always says, these are not the one they should be slashing when things get hard, you know, kind of, I can, you know, I can only kind of reinforce this message. It seems like, you know, an important one. Not being too myopic and really thinking about, you know, kind of a, the longer term uh, value of the organization seems, you know, seems key. Not losing track of that. Very strategic view. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to wrap up some additional questions that we did get through the chat and then ask you all to close. Um, I wanted to circle back to wages in light of uh, a potential recession. So I think we heard about wage compression and we talked a little bit about cost of labor versus um, cost of living. And Holly, we did get a question about something that you mentioned in your kind of your opening comments about um, performance based cuts to pay and how that plays out. I mean, we're going into a period of time where maybe 18 months ago, you hired someone at the very top or even above of your, their range because you had to, and you might not need to going forward. Like it's just kind of a funky time. Um, how would you think about that, say, going into the next year or two? Well, I think um, the example you just referenced about, you know, um, when we were in, a, you know, a tighter labor market and we, you know, we're, we're desperate to hire certain roles. So maybe we paid um, above range um, and we went overboard. That is exactly what's going to lead um, to the need to um, potentially lay off workers or potentially embrace an approach um, that's very performance-based. And, you know, people, uh, companies were hiring uh, might not have been, you know, the highest performers at the time either. Um, so I think you're going to see organizations um, take action as they're tightening their belts uh, to, you know, potentially consider what does it look like to shrink the workforce? And I think there'll be a variety of, of methods uh, deployed. Um, but that speaks to um, what, what I said at the start about, you know, continuing um, to, to look at market competitive wages, to think about things in terms of um, cost of labor um, and making decisions that consider the long term. Um, because I don't think any um, organization would relish, you know, um, having to cut a large swath of, of their workforce. But I think things that happened, um, you know, during the pandemic and over the past year to get people into the door and into jobs, I, I think that's going to put more pressure on the situation. So I think taking a very measured view, being sure to consider, you know, what look to be sustained trends versus something that might correct itself um, within the next 12 months. I, I, I think it's it's going to be it's it's going to be uh, critical. Um, thank you. Marianne, do you have anything else to add about guess, just what you see guess, in wages? I guess yeah, I think the only thing I would add to this is, you know, kind of circling back to inflation. I mean, a little bit of inflation is not, you know, is not a bad thing. Uh, and, you know, we know the Fed is, you know, eyeing this 2% that has always been the goal. You know, in an environment where inflation is a little higher than that, that gives the employer another tool, right, to try to, you know, kind of adjust to a situation. We know that wages are very much rigid nominally downwards. You know, employers rarely, you know, in all the data they've seen, cut wages, you know, nominally. But when you have a bit more inflation, another way for employers to adjust rather than just firing people is just to not provide, you know, kind of as high nominal wage increases. And if these wage increases don't track inflation, they're essentially kind of reducing, kind of reducing their costs. So I think there's an important conversation that's happening right now, which is that. We've lived, you know, in an environment where 2% has always been the target. We, we have experienced, you know, over the last, going back to the financial crisis, environment where there are a lot of shocks in the system. You know, a bit more inflation kind of provides a bit of that grease that may, you know, enable employers to do things that are, you know, kind of much less dramatic in people's life, like, you know, kind of cutting jobs, um, enable them, enable, you know, kind of the, those companies to retain these people at the same time, kind of reducing kind of real cost. So just, you know, it's going to be, what I'm trying to say is that it's going to be interesting to see whether the Fed is going to really going to try to go down to 2% or whether we're going to be moving to another environment where, 
you know, there'll be a bit more of that kind of inflation grace uh, going forward in the economy. So as, as we close, I'd like to ask you each both to, as you reflect on the past couple of years and operating in this environment of uncertainty, which we've all gotten the professional opportunity to spend some time in these past few years, what lessons will you take forward um, that will inform your approach and that um, you, know, you really consider your lesson learned for the past couple of years that will, will take us forward um, into the future? Well, did you want to do you want to go first? Sure, sure. No, I think you know we've we've learned a great deal. Um, I I would say you know first of all the focus on company culture is really key. I mean that is what's going to drive your retention, leading to lower turnover costs, and leading to an overall uh, better employee experience where you know, candidates want to apply, people want to join and people, people want to stay at the end of the day and building the employer brand that, that really promotes that. Um, so I think that's really critical. I think this concept, con, uh, this concept of the lessons of needing uh, flexibility and choice and understanding the needs of your workforce are, are really, really key. And the more you can build and support your managers in developing to build these real connections um, and relationships of trust with their team so you can better understand how to meet their needs, I think, um, you know, is, is really key as well. And all of these things we've been discussing, all of these, uh, you know, HR practices, they're all interconnected. Um, you know, I'm often asked about what area of HR do you like the most? And wh what I often say is it's the connectivity between all of the, the different HR um, roles and centers of excellence that I think really makes a difference. I think at the end of the day, um, we're going to keep seeing a pay for performance culture. I know that's, uh, you know, most of our uh, rewards philosophies at organizations. I think, you know, with all of the trends we're talking about, high performance high performers with valuable skill sets will always be marketable um, at the end of the day. So you you need to think about that and, and you need to think about the macro and the micro um, as well. So I, I just hope um, that we see many of the things that we've learned and many of the, the practices like remote work being a great example and hybrid work. I, I hope they continue, um, you know, long past uh, the, this this period. I yeah. Again, clearly, clearly I agree with, you know, kind of with all of this, I um, maybe a, a bit narrower, you know, a narrow lesson and, and a chance for me to, you know, kind of talk about one aspect of, of the economy and labor market that we have not talked about so much. I think, you know, when, when we went into the COVID recession, you know, there was, Congress was extremely aggressive in, you know, providing, you know, kind of reinforcing the unemployment insurance system. Um, you know, offering more resources to people. For some people, they end up making more money on UI than they were doing at their job because things were done, you know, kind of very quickly on the rush, trying to save, salvage the economy. Um, this was also a moment in time where Congress thought about that really important growing segment of the labor market that we've not talked about, which is all of the gig workforce. And that's not just Uber and Lyft and, you know, your, your delivery people and, and, and really kind of Understanding that they, this kind of segment of the workforce has no safety net that they can that they can look at and really extending unemployment insurance to uh, to this group. Unfortunately, that is expired. But I think these were you know that worked really well. I think there were a lot of people worried about the the building this incentive effect to look for work when unemployment insurance was so high. The postmortem on this for people that have looked at the data is that there was a little bit of a, neg a neg negative kind of incentive to, to, you know, to look for work, but not large at all, especially in comparison with, you know, kind of the, um, the ability this support gave to people to kind of maintain, you know, kind of a decent, a decent life as they were struggling through uh, an economic and a healthcare crisis. And, and I very much hope that, you know, kind of that's a le lessons I keep on, you know, kind of getting learning. One of the things that, you know, kind of, I worry about in this country is that our safety net is very weak. The crisis kind of gave us an opportunity to, again, experiment with something that was more aggressive than what had been done before. And it proved, you know, it proved extre extremely worthwhile. 
Well, thank you both for sharing your insights and um, thoughts on preparing for a recession. We really appreciate um, all the time that you've put into this and thank you all for joining us on the Zoom today. Um, we hope to see you at an Executive Club Hermac Institute event in the future. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.